Welcome back, everyone, to Aspire, the Leadership Development Podcast, where we will be discussing the visions, inspirations, and experiences from top educational leaders. My name is Joshua Stamper, and you can connect with me on Twitter or on Instagram at Joshua double underscore Stamper. Welcome back, Aspire listeners, to the second Aspire to Lead episode. I'm so excited to have another contributing author. And I'll be honest, when I was putting together the book, I asked a lot of authors about different topics and just really gave them the option of of choosing one. And for for this author, I really was specific about, hey, I really want to talk about empathy. Will you please write a chapter? And he said yes. And it is the amazing Nathan Maynard. Nathan, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Josh. So if you don't know Nathan, he co-wrote a, an amazing book, Hacking Discipline, and he has not only been on the Aspire podcast multiple times, but we had the opportunity to have him at our school to speak to our staff on a lot of different topics on restorative practices, social emotional learning, and I think most important, uh, mindfulness. And as we all know, this this last couple of years have been pretty trying. And I can't tell you the impact Nathan had on our staff. It was tremendous and it, the exact message that we needed. And Nathan, I don't know, man, if you realize, but you were just absolutely amazing with our staff and, and they're still talking about the sessions that we had. So thank you so much for, for being a huge resource last year. Of course. Yeah. I, I really appreciate you all having me on. I know it's been a trying year for everyone too last year. Yeah. Let's talk about a little bit about yourself, because I know the listeners probably have, have heard you before, but just in case they haven't listened to those prior episodes on the Aspire podcast, which they really should do because, you know, we dove into restorative practices and social emotional learning in those episodes, but will you just share a little bit about yourself and what you're doing right now? Yeah, for sure. So um, I got started, my, my background, I studied behavioral neuroscience, and um, I got trained in restorative practices actually in 2008 timeframe, and I've been doing it ever since. It's been a huge passion of mine. The, I remember the first couple of times I did a restorative mediation, um, just sort of the way it made me feel where you're just really empowering someone else and really diving into sort of the topic we're going to talk about is this empathy component. And then from there, I just, I, I fell in love with the practices and um, I did, um, you know, I worked eight years in the juvenile justice field as a youth worker. Um, I worked in a residential treatment care center. Um, I really enjoyed it really enjoyed um, working with that population, their families and, and growing from that experience. From there, I went into education. Um, I did that for just a little under four years. Then my last position, I was down in Indianapolis, Indiana, where I'm currently at now. And I was a school administrator. And it was just an amazing experience. I've had a lot of experience with implementation of restorative practices and supporting um, as a practitioner, as someone that's been, you know, believes in the field and, and have done it. And so that's, that's really what I do full time now is I train staff, I, I do different sort of skill building training, I do implementation training, right. um, I partner with, you know, amazing minds out there that like, are really good with systems work, equity work, and how to blend everything together, because we don't want to really look at some of these practices as siloed initiatives. And that's really what I'm doing full time now. And it's a huge blessing. It is a blessing, man. And for not only for yourself, but for those who you're impacting, I know your message is so strong. And, and that really came through in this contribution. And I really want to dive into that because I didn't really have like a favorite chapter, but this was one that I was extremely passionate about. As you know, you know, I'm one that also speaks about trauma informed practices and um, yeah. with, you know, my own family and, and our, our foster children, what an impact it's been not only as an educator, but as a, as a father reading your, your contribution was, was moving, man. It was really powerful. So your chapter was two choices of empathy. And I would love to dive into your mindset when you're writing this. And why do you think empathy is so important? I think empathy is that not not just term, but sort of situation, the, the experience we have that we can really embrace one another on a deeper level with. I think a lot of times when we're trying to connect with someone, we try to connect in different ways. You know, if, if I'm talking to a student and they mention Minecraft and then maybe I mention how, hey, I have a six year old son. He plays Minecraft. Too, and I try to connect through this. And sometimes that works. But other times it becomes superficial or sort of tokenizing that relationship. When you dive into empathy, you truly start to get to understand the other person without your perspectives, um, your privilege, whatever you're bringing into that relationship. So it really checks us into making sure that we're, you know, bringing our true self to it and just really respecting the other person on a deeper level. And the more that we, we, we look at this empathy, the more that we can really build our systems of 
learning around these empathy components. Um, you know, in the book, we talk a lot about discipline, that teaching tool, how to use this through empathy. And just empathy is just such a powerful way for us just to not just show respect to one another and connect with them, but really teach through that empathy. So what are some ways that you use empathy as a leader when you were a building principal? I think the, the biggest thing that I've done with, with empathy is probably just understanding that when a situation occurs, that I'm not going to assume I know everything and assume that I know what's what's taking place or what may be going on. I take a step back and I just use really good listening. I show that I, I respect the other person. I want to understand where they're coming from. And then from there, that that's where I, I do the work. That's where I decide, you know, what avenue to go down, where, where, where I should go. So many times as a leader, we're trying to make really quick decisions. You know, we have, you know, I, I mean, I remember being a school administrator and you know, I was dealing with a, you know, let's say like a physical altercation, had a parent on the phone, had someone upset in my front office. Um, I have a teacher that, you know, needs to, you know, head home for a family situation. Like, and you're trying to balance all these different things. And sometimes it goes to the wayside because we're trying to make these quick decisions and do this. But when we take a step back and, and come up with these strategies to still develop and, and understand the empathy of who we're communicating at that time. And, you know, just Joshua, what I was talking to your staff about being really intentional with our practices and what we're about, the more that we're intentional and in saying like empathy matters, empathy is what we connect around. Empathy is where, you know, we're going to learn the best from. Then we become really strategic with how we learn this empathy. So as a leader, the, the biggest thing that I've done for empathy is just one, just understanding it's such a key component to all of my relationships with the staff and with everyone that I work with. And when you understand that, it becomes such a good teaching tool and such a good tool to connect with them on that level that's not superficial. So if there's someone out there that's listening and thinks, you know, for a leader to be empathetic is a weakness, what would you say to them? I, w I would question why, and I would question sort of, you know, where that comes from, because I think a lot of times, the old school punitive discipline and, and compliance based schools. And, you know, you, you teach to, you know, the first two weeks, you don't smile till Christmas, you know, all these different types of sort of mindsets that we have, we need a pound of flesh after, you know, wrongdoing takes place. A lot of these things are rooted in, we don't understand the why we just remember someone taught us that we remember that someone told us this was good. And I feel like that would be the same thing around this empathy. I, I would question where this came from, because when we're looking at empathy, I don't really see any weaknesses that this could cause the biggest sort of con if I'm pushing on the other side would be, yeah, sometimes it takes some time you know, around the intentionality. And we need to really be aware of our time as an educator. But again, if we're strategic with our time, if we're intentional with our time, you know, this empathy is not going to really weigh down, um, you know, that precious time that we have. You titled your piece, Two Choices of Empathy. And not that I want you to hash out, you know, every aspect of what you wrote, but what are those two choices? The understanding what the empathy is, or sort of just going through the empathy and, you know, sort of ignoring it and sort of just going through a situation and not really embracing it, but, you know, just going through those choices. And when we're going through those, those choices of different empathy and how we can build upon those, you know, that empathy statement, yeah. it's all about where we're going to sort of build that next step and sort of scaffold that into support. I think that a lot of times, you know, we make mistakes also. And if we don't take a, a, a chance to build that empathy, sometimes, you know, mistakes happen and that, you know, we're all human. We all make mistakes, but there's a lot of vulnerability that comes from, you know, owning those mistakes and going through those situations. And I think, you know, again, it goes to some of the sort of fixed mindsets around some of the older, you know, mindsets around discipline and, and situations as a leader we need to take a step back and also understand that when situations do occur, it doesn't show weakness. It shows really true social emotional learning. If I make a mistake and I own that with who I made a mistake to, that's not just causing, you know, creating sort of social emotional learning within that small impact, but everyone else that was sort of stakeholders into that situation also. This podcast is a proud member of the Teach Better Podcast Network. Better today, better tomorrow, and the podcast to get you there. You can find out more at teachbetter.com slash podcast. Now let's get back to the episode. So Nathan, you know on this podcast, I always love giving actionable items for my listeners. So 
generally I ask just over an overarching you know leadership topic but for today since we're talking about empathy if there's someone listening that wants to increase being more of an empathetic leader what is something they can do tomorrow or next week yeah and I think and this is something I, I talk a lot about because with restorative practices with my sort of you know current blessing of uh, you know voice to talk to other educators you know I talk a lot but as a leader, as someone that, you know, is, is a youth worker, as an as a, um, educator working with kids too, it's all about how we are a good listener. We talk less, ask more questions. We're okay with silence. We're okay with pauses. You know, we, we show that we're a safe person. Um, you know, I've, I've had plenty of situations before that someone's been upset at me and have been using, you know, choice words and, and situations have escalated. But those type of situations are the most testing and the most tolling on us too at the same time. But we need to show that we're a safe person and that we're a good listener and that we can really build this up as I care about you. I want to get to know the situation and not just jumping through the hoops because everyone can see that. So being really aware that we're in this to learn from the other person. So just intentionality around all of those things. Nathan, let's talk about something that you are going to be launching here very, very soon, which is the restorative group. What is that all about? Yeah. So the restorative group is something that, you know, Brad and I have been developing um, for a while now. Um, we've been bringing in so many amazing thought partners into this work. Um, you know, one of the great ones, one of my friends, Dr. Luke Roberts, he's done a lot of research out of Cambridge over restorative practices and um, systems work. I'm um, Dr. Lori Desatelli's with some of the work that she's done with applied neuroscience. Um, Liz Brahas, you know, uh, Belinda George, we talked to her today, bringing in all these great minds to come about and really develop programs that's going to stick with schools and not just sort of fall off after a couple years of implementation. Right. So we're trying to be really intentional around what this restorative practices looks like. It's not just the disciplines practices, it's not just a relationship based approach. It's the way we really dive into the pedagogy of our, our schools and, and what it's about. We've had some really good data over the last three years when we've been sort of working through this model and developing this with different school districts around the United States. And we're really up to scaling this up to really support the schools. We don't want to be a one and done sort of training, the, the sort of spray and pray model, hoping, you know, certain situations stick. You know, we want to come into, you know, districts and schools and partner with them to really grow the capacity within the building to be restorative, Focus on equity as the number one component there, social emotional learning as the priority, trauma informed care, using those applied neuroscience techniques and developing such a great model that it's not just beneficial for the students and the educators, but it's easy to do because there's always this, you know, you, you know, Josh being a school administrator, there's this dream world, right? I, I do conflict resolution and it takes, you know, 30 minutes and it's perfect and it goes excellent every single time. And every single one of my classrooms does amazing community building circles and, and conflict resolution circles. But then there's a, the, the reality of things, right? And it's like, hey, it's stressful. The kid just flipped over a desk. We just had two fights today. We have a parent upset. And that's what our program's about. It's the, the reality because everyone that's part of the restorative group has been educators or are still currently educators that help develop this program. So it's really focused on what teachers can actually do in the situation that's not going to really bear them out of what you know they're there for, which is building those relationships and to teach. Nathan, that's amazing. I, I'm so excited for you and, and this project. So for those who are listening, the restorative group put together with a, a amazing team. I'm just so excited to see what, what comes of that group. So Nathan, how can our listeners connect with you on social media? Yeah. So um, I would say the number one way is probably through Twitter. So at in Maynard EDU, I'm also on Facebook. I got a Facebook group um, and the Facebook group is called Hacking School Discipline. That's the book that Brad and I wrote. And those are the two main ways that we have to connect. We will be launching our um, restorativegroup.org website within the end of September. But if anyone's interested in it before then, you know, feel free to reach out to me on those other channels. Wonderful. Make sure you're connecting with Nathan and, and Brad. They are doing amazing work. Of course, check out their book too. If you are looking for a link, it'll be in the show notes. Nathan, it's always an honor to talk with you, but even more so to have you a part of the Aspire to Lead book. So thank you so much for contributing. I know it's going to bring a lot of value to aspiring leaders. Yeah, and thank you for letting me do that, Josh. I was really humbled that you asked me for that. <laughs>